This is Alex. And this is James. And you're listening to the American Toffee Podcast. What is up, everybody? We are here getting ready for our World Cup final match in the beginning of March. We're going to start off by previewing the Derby match at Goodison Park coming this Sunday. And then we're also going to talk to a fellow Evertonian about his experiences going to Derby matches. So first up, obviously James is with me. And then we have Brendan Brown from the San Francisco Toffees. Brendan, how are you doing? I'm great. I'm great. How are you guys doing? Fantastic. Doing very well. Nerves starting to set in a little little bit. Just a little. Yep. I uh, traditionally do not like the Derby at all. Not afraid to admit it. Well, I think for, I know at least for James and I, I'm going to assume for you as well that uh, we haven't been following Everton long enough to have any sort of positive, you know, relationship with the Derby. Otherwise, so you are part of the supporters group under Everton USA, specifically the San Francisco Toffees. So, you know, how big are y'all? What, you know, what do you do to meet up? Do you do anything else other than watch the match together? That sort of thing? Yeah. So um, I actually started the group, I think it was back in 2013. Um, It was right around the time that Everton was doing the um, International Champions Cup uh, tour, and they played Juventus at AT AT&T Park, where the San Francisco Giants play. Um, And I had actually just moved back to San Francisco. I'm originally from here. I had just moved back after uh, being in Colorado for about seven years. And I was, you know, supporting... Everton in Colorado and I came back and I was obviously interested in getting tickets to the match and sitting with other Everton supporters and sort of found out that there wasn't really an organized group in San Francisco. Um, And I was talking, I think with David Kurtz who, you know, kind of started the whole Everton USA thing. And he, he, was like, yeah, just start it. You do it. And I was like, well, that sounds like a lot. And he's like, no, just make a Twitter and make a Facebook group and see what happens. So I did. And I just like found a feature on Facebook where you could like search people who live in San Francisco who also like Everton. And I just invited them all into this Facebook group um, and then started a Twitter account. And I think we have like 150 people in the Facebook group. Um, we definitely don't get nearly that many people to the actual pub for the games. I'd say, you know, on average we're, you know, five people, but yeah, it's, it's pretty fun. Um, I've met a lot of great people. We don't do too much outside of watching Everton, um, two members who are, probably like the most dedicated members of the group, Marshall and Catherine. Um, We also support our local club, SF City FC. Marshall helps us with some uh, PR stuff and he comes to the games and Catherine comes to the games as well. But, um, and then there's a few others that support the local club as well. But that's, uh, that's kind of the rundown on the group, SF Evertonians. That's awesome. I'm really jealous that y'all have, you know, Y'all have something set up, obviously, all you're doing, but I wish that my area, Southeastern Virginia, still had a uh, any sort of soccer club, whether that was amateur or else. Yeah, um, it's a lot Alex of fun. Is, yeah. um, we sort of, we've had a real tough time with uh, competitive soccer clubs in this city. A lot of teams have come and gone, folded, left shop, earthquakes moved to Houston, and there's a lot of great culture here and you know a bunch of soccer supporters got together and they said you know what this is we need something that's about this community that's not going to leave that's something permanent something that gives back some something that is you know has a real connection so sf city is actually 51 percent fan owned club so when you 
become a member, you basically own equity in the club and it ensures that, you know, the the club doesn't move unless everyone votes. They don't change league if unless everyone votes. They don't change logo, name, you know, the fans voting on it. So that's pretty cool. That's very cool to have that. The fan owned premise is something that's kind of a staple of or was a staple of English football. And I guess in America, it, sports in general, professional sports have become so commercialized that you, you it's rare to see something like that. So it's cool that to really feel like you're actually a part of the organization and, and not just feel like it, but actually be a part of it. Because, you know, professional football teams, for example, they want the fans to feel engaged. But at the same time, you're you're not really you're just like, a, you know, a paying customer essentially at the end of the day. So it's cool to have that that level of engagement with the club. So switching gears to the Derby match coming up in a few days. James, I believe you have a pretty intimidating statistic for us. Yeah, so I saw this today. This <laughs> made me feel pretty scared and even less optimistic than I was feeling already. Liverpool have more clean sheets than goals conceded in the Premier League this season. They have 16 clean sheets and 15 goals conceded. So that is the size of the task that sits at the feet of Everton on Sunday. It's not going to be easy, which n- no one expects it to be, but it's a derby game. And in those games, logic kind of goes out the window to some extent. And we're at home as well. So anything can happen this week, actually, or in the last week leading up to the derby match, Jurgen Klopp said that f- this is going to be a tough match because Everton view it as a World Cup final. It's been all over Everton Twitter, hence why. I introduced this episode as previewing the World Cup final for Everton in March of an off year. What do you all think about that? Does that kind of, does that make you mad? Does that, is that indifferent? It's just, you know, it's kind of mind games from Jurgen Klopp. He is saying this because he knows it will A, make Liverpool fans, you know, they'll rejoice and laugh and they'll have all the crying eye emojis on Twitter and they'll be able to have that little bit of banter, but it also rile Evertonians up. And hopefully it only serves, you know, to add fuel to the fire that's that's building inside Marco Silva's locker room right now. And this is the perfect type of thing that that he can show the players and say, look, this is what the opposition think of you. And but un- unfortunately, in a way, he's not really wrong. You know, there's a lot riding on this game. I think if we were to win this game and lose the rest of the games, it wouldn't be good. But most fans would take after such a long drought, a derby win over any other win in the league, it would certainly put Marco Silva in a very positive light amongst Evertonians. And so in a way he's not wrong, but it just is, it's a classic Klopp arrogant comment that just kind of rubs you the wrong way. Yeah. I mean, I, I agree. And I've heard a lot of, you know, Liverpool fans on Twitter or whatever on the internet say, you know, Oh, this is your cup final. Like you guys don't have any cup finals. So this is it for you. And you know, it's it's fair, it's banter, whatever. Um, but yeah, I mean, I sort of agree with you, James. Like, it's sort of true. Like, I don't think we're qualifying for Europe. I don't think we're getting relegated. This is, like, Sunday is it, right? Like, it's the only big match we have. We don't, you know, we're out of the cups. We're, it, like, makes or breaks the season. I, you know, if we win and, and lose the rest of the matches, I think some people would be okay with that. Obviously, you know, like if you're level headed about it, you want to take as many points as you can. But yeah, this match does it does matter more than all the other ones for sure. Well, the ironic part about it is the fact that he he surely celebrated like it was his World Cup final, the first go around at Anfield. Right. When there was just some stupid, insane goal scored that bounced off the crossbar twice. You yeah, know. so fluky. Right. So it's like, okay, I get it. But at the same time, did you see yourself? I just don't like Klopp at all. It's that simple. He originally, when he first came to Liverpool, I kind of had some respect for him because he was not quite as arrogant as he has become. But now that he's been in the role for so long now, it just wears, wears you thin. The, the freak outs, the constant deflecting of blame from his team, which the other day when he, when he, against Manchester United when he blamed Manchester United's players getting injured as disrupting Liverpool's momentum. And that's why they weren't able to perform at such a high standard. 
He's blamed the weather. He's blamed the pitch. He's blamed everything else. And it just, I'm just sick of it. I just would really, really love to just for us to score like a, you know, in the way that the first game ended on, and it kind of has derailed our season ever since it would just be so fitting and like perfect. And here I go again, like talking myself into it for us to like get a win in this game and shut all the Liverpool fans up and shut Jurgen Klopp up and then kick on for the rest of the year. You know, the worst part is this man's has candy corn for teeth. <laughs> so true. That's all I got out of that conversation, James. That's it. <laughs> yeah. I hate that guy. A good takeaway. I actually like, I didn't mind him at first. I was actually admittedly like kind of a fan when he was at Borussia Dortmund. And then when Liverpool got him, I was, I was a little jealous. I was, you know, I was like, Dan, that's, that's a good hire. You know, I think he'll fit in well, but yeah, you're right. It's just like over time he has gotten more arrogant and I like him less and less as time goes on. And Further- yeah, the way the way he celebrated that goal, it was just like, you know, that was like that was such a fluke. That was just a mistake. It was so lucky. It was like you're you're acting like, you know, somebody hit a you know, a Jaggy Elka goal from thirty yards out. It's one of those things that celebration in particular is just in in generally, honestly, his his actions overall are things that if he's your manager, you love that stuff and you eat it up because it's perfect to like for the social media era to have these types of little tidbits and, and nuggets. But then if you're the opposition, you despise it. And that's just kind of the nature of sport. And I'm never going to like a Liverpool manager. And I certainly don't like Jurgen Klopp. So let's get into the meat and potatoes of the episode. Let's talk tactics. From my perspective, although we're going to be at Goodison Park, I think I'm going to expect Liverpool to try and possess the ball. And seeing as how their play is so focused on their wingers being involved and trying to you know, cut di- diagonally and really stretch the defense, I think that they're, they're going to focus on overloading the wings, which you know, could be an issue for Everton. Yeah, um, they obviously have really quality players on the wings, and I, I, yeah, I don't think we're going to hold the majority of the possession in this match at all. We, yeah, we might have to kind of hunker down and and play a counterattacking style. I'm not really sure, um, but yeah, we've we've got you know we've got to mark three really good forwards, and then you know they've got you know some really good midfielders too, and we somehow got to keep them all from you know possessing the ball too much in our end i think the physicality overall of everton if we come out the gates strong and maybe make a crunching early tackle really getting the crowd behind the team early on is going to be a big factor the atmosphere overall will be a big factor but i also think that liverpool are a really well-rounded team and they can beat you on the break or they can you know, clinically break you down by playing through the midfield. I'm more concerned about them coming at us with speed because that's where their I think their their greatest strengths are. And so I would expect, you know, when we played them at Anfield, there was I was honestly pretty blown away with how evenly we were able to to play with them. Um the possession wasn't was was fairly even and we did create a fair amount of chances. Now that we're at home, assuming the atmosphere is okay, I'd expect us to be able to control some you know, control some spaces. I think depending on what our lineup looks like, it'll be very interesting to see if what, what type of changes Marco Silva makes. And we'll speculate on that in a little bit, but we're going to have to first and foremost, be very defensively resolute. And so that's going to be key. What the, the midfield personnel that he chooses, whoever sits in front of that defense is going to have to be ready, but also like the outside backs. I'm fully confident that Luca Dean's going to be able to lock down, um, Sala, but then you know Seamus Coleman against Mane, those types of matchups, and they're so flu- they're so fluid, and and they can break you down in an instant with pace, with a quick give and go. I just it's hard to feel very confident going into this game, despite the fact that we won three 0 at Cardiff, like it's Cardiff, and now we're playing the league leaders. Uh, I don't know, I don't know how it's going to look, but I think Marco Silva will have a fairly solid plan going into this. Yeah, I mean, he showed his tactical flexibility against Cardiff and maybe to the general fan, they have not seen it this season. But if you look really closely, you know, if, if you if you do your homework like 
James and I do when, you know, preparing for episodes, whether that's before or after a match, then you see a lot of a lot of tweaks to how we're playing. Maybe not the personnel, but or or maybe not the types of positions, right? Playing a lot of box to box midfielders and that sort of thing. But we saw it when he played Schneiderlin in terms of how that was able to kind of overload Cardiff's wings or the wings in general, but overload overload their outside backs and put us in four v three situations on on the offensive. And so I think that honestly he's going to be prepared, and I think that our players are going to be prepared, and I think they're going to be up for the fight too. It's just going to come down to concentration, really. And and my key is going to be don't be afraid to take a shot. We saw them trying to take shots more, I think, against Cardiff, specifically Theo Walcott, not that he got a shot on target, but the point is you need that sort of pressure placed on the opposition as early as possible. That that That's my, my kind of thought process. So let's talk lineups, and we're going to do it a little bit differently. All three of us are going to take an area of the pitch, right? Defense, midfield, front line, and then we can kind of have a discussion based on whoever's pick. So James, would you like to start us off with the defense? Yeah, I'd be happy to. So the defense pretty much picks himself. At this point, it's it's Thursday night. We're not yet sure if Yeri Mean is fit, but I would say that after Seamus Coleman seemed to have returned to form against Cardiff, that he'd be a lock at the right back position. And then you kind of have to go with Jaggy Elka and Keane in the center. They played well enough, at least, in, or I guess... I guess you could bring Kurt Zuma back. I didn't. I kind of forgot that he. Yeah, was Zuma's not. Sus- is, yeah. he's he's not suspended anymore, right. right? Yeah, you're right. Totally right. Space that. Um, hundred percent. Zuma comes back in for Jagielka. Then it's going to be Keen and Zuma. All credit to Phil, Phil Jagielka for stepping up when needed. But Kurt Zuma's a, a far superior player at this point, and I like that partnership quite a bit. I think they'll be able to muscle up. They'll be able to keep Firmino at bay for the most part. Bully him a little bit. Uh, probably knock him down a couple times, which I'll like to see. And then, uh, on the, of course, Luca Dean will retain his spot on the left, probably our best player this year, hoping that he can, he can hold things down as well. So I think that that's a, a fairly certain defensive pick, but it's the Derby. So who really knows? Yeah. Um, I sort of agree. I mean, I, I don't know if, I don't know if Zoom is an automatic hundred percent starter. Um, Jack Yelka obviously made that pretty big mistake that almost led to a goal at the beginning of the Cardiff match but he seemed to settle down and I mean also it's the derby right like he's been our captain for so long he's been on the squad for so long so um whereas you know Zuma's a lone player so maybe maybe that factors in but um I don't know I don't know if he's I don't know if it's a hundred percent Zuma coming back right away you know, I'm I'm of completely split minds of the two also. My positives for Zuma would be his pace. And then obviously Jagielka would be the intangible, which would be the leadership, the 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 mindset, you know, the fact that he has obviously played in many, many derby matches before. So honestly, I'm not going to be upset no matter which of the two they choose, but I think I honestly do believe that the defense will be ready. You can't, but you can't, uh, you can't discount the fear that would be in the hearts of the Liverpool players if Jagielka were to play and he does get into the opposition in around the 18 yard box um, <laughs> with balls coming out off of, off of a uh, set piece. You know that they're going to be shaking in their boots for that thunderous volley that will inevitably go in the top top 90. Throw in James McCarthy while you're at it. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so moving on to the midfield, I'm going to continue the trend with a with a 4-3-3, right? And I do love a hot take, don't I, James? You're a fan. <laughs> so, oh, I can't wait for this now. <laughs> so, here's what I'm going to say. You're going to put James McCarthy in the midfield, aren't you? <laughs> no, not that hot of a take, right? Okay. But good guess, good guess. I'm not I'm not above it. So, I'm actually going to say that I'd like to see Schneiderlin retain his place in the starting lineup. I'd like to see Ghana line up near him. And then I'd like to see Gilfie Sigurdsson start. So the same midfield three as we saw on Tuesday. And here's why. We're going to need the defensive stability of a true defensive midfielder, a true holding midfielder. And, you know, as I've kind of ranted on Twitter, as 
Actually, David Hughes wrote a really good article for the Liverpool Echo with graphics and all to, to kind of show the effect Schneiderlin had on the squad. We forget how well the team played when Schneiderlin and Ghana used to play together. And it, it's annoying because people get caught up on titles, right? Two defensive midfielders. But here's the thing, though. We saw Ghana play out of his mind on Tuesday, and, and people can say, okay, it's Cardiff, but that's not the case, though. It's the fact that he wasn't, he wasn't forced to sit back and sit deep and try to ping long balls, because if we know anything, long passes are not his strength. He can connect the midfield or the, he can connect the midfield to the offense to, to your forward players, but he's not afforded that opportunity because he hasn't had another defensive midfielder. And so I think Schneiderlin brings a solid defensive ability, but he allows Ghana and then by association, Gilfie Sigurdsson to play in their most comfortable way. I wouldn't be upset with that either. I mean, it does leave out Andre Gomez, who, you know, obviously his first couple of matches, he was incredible, but he's, um, you know, not been so great lately. But yeah, I mean, Schneiderlin was really good on Tuesday. Um, and yeah, I mean, Ghana was out of his mind on Tuesday. It, he was so good. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't mind that seeing that uh, midfield three. I love that Alex's hot take is that he'll stick with the same midfield that just played. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was gonna say Scorcher. too. That wasn't that hot of a take. Uh, but no, I am my own hype man. Yeah, he likes to hype. he likes to get this giant build up and then you know lay down the songs. <laughs> but but I I w- I don't I'm not opposed to seeing Morgan Schneiderlin play, but it just seems criminal to leave a player like Andre Gomez on the bench. Um, I understand. I, I do agree that we do need to be very defensively resolute because ultimately our goal should be to take points from this game and a win is going to be hard to come by. You know, they don't drop points very often. If we were to get one point, it basically would be a victory for us uh, as far as, you know, reti- <clears throat> just getting points on the board against a side like that because we've yet to do so. I mean, did, we, we picked up the point against Chelsea, of course, but um, I think that you have to play Andre Gomez and, and play... Maybe even I don't think you can leave Ghana out. So I think you have to go Ghana and play Gomez and potentially Sigurdsson as well, because we do need that like creative, deep lying playmaker. Um, but but as you say, Alex, I'm and Brendan, I, I'm not opposed to seeing the same lineup roll out because if it ain't broke, don't fix it. All right, Brendan. Yeah. So here's what it is: our fate hinges upon your pick for our front line because we all know that it seems as though no matter. What anyone thinks, our our forwards are are on a bit of a scoring drought. Yeah. Um. Well, I'll, I guess I'll just start with my impressions from Tuesday. Um, I thought it was possibly the worst match I've ever seen Richarlison play. Um, I don't know what happened. Uh, you know, he was looking like our best player for the beginning of the season um scoring goals everywhere and then i don't know what happened on tuesday but he was you know giving the ball away making really lazy passes and just you could see it when he got subbed off he was the first one to get subbed off and you could just see it on his face he knew he had a terrible game um so i i don't know i don't know if we drop him or we have to bring him back because he's obviously you know he he's one of the most talented players we have. Um, Walcott also, even though he did seem lively and he took a lot of shots, I just, he was so frustrating for me on Tuesday. I, he gave the ball away so many times. And I honestly, I wanted Walcott subbed off first on Tuesday. Um, so I thought, yeah, just both wings were terrible i don't know how we won 3-0 <laughs> cardiff was terrible but um i bernard came on on tuesday and was amazing so i think i want to see bernard and i you know he's not the most popular guy among everton fans but i am a massive fan of look men um i'm a little worried because a, a derby is just kind of it's a different game altogether there's like a lot more, there's so much more pressure. Um, and, you know, m- the mental aspect of the game is probably where Lookman, you know, is weakest. 
Um, so I'm not sure if it's the best game for him, but I think he's also one of the most talented players we have. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think, I think I, I would pick Bernard and Lookman as my wingers. What about your striker? Striker, I'm going with Dominic Calvert Lewin again. Um, he looks pretty. He looked pretty good on Tuesday. I really liked his finish at the end of the game. He he's kind of seemed like in the past, like the player that takes one too many touches and tries to do a little bit too much when you just like you just want to scream at him, just shoot the ball. And he just did that on Tuesday. He just he was far out and he just took the shot anyways. And you know, um, we don't obviously don't have too many options i guess we could start with charleston up top like we've done before um we could start uh sank tosin he hasn't looked that great um so i don't know i'm I'm sticking with dcl up top i'm gonna agree with you brendan with your entire front three i think with charleston probably could make an impact as a sub but given bernard's substitute performance on tuesday i think he he warrants a start Looks very dangerous. Probably our most technically gifted player besides maybe Gilfie Sigurdsson. So I think that he could cause Liverpool defense some serious problems, assuming he doesn't get broken in half because, of course, he is very small. Uh, and then DCL, because of what he he offers, the combination, what he offers as far as strength and pace, like, you know, Cenk Tosin probably has more strength than hold-up play. Richarlison has more raw pace, potentially. But the combination of the two in Calvert-Lewin, um, and as, as well as his aerial prowess gives him the, the most well-rounded striker that we have at the moment. So I say he starts up top and then, I don't know, I think you I, I'd like to see Lookman as well, but I'm suspecting that he'll go with Theo Walcott because I just, I can't figure out what's going on with Adam Lookman behind the scenes. It baff, continues to baffle me. Me too. Yeah, I agreed pretty much, right? Bernard dictates the start, Calvert-Lewin, fantastic finish. I think it's just with Theo Walcott, he never fails. He's a, he's a smart player and he never fails to get himself in positions to either score or potentially lay in a, a free cross. The issue is for some reason this season, he just cannot put together the final touch, the final pass, the final shot. And so it's just, I think Marco Silva with such inconsistency in goals scored. You know, I mentioned this on Tuesday, but prior to the Cardiff match, we had five goals in the last eight matches. Then maybe he's going with a more known quantity, which is Theo Walcott, right? He knows Theo Walcott's going to offer getting in those positions, breaking past the back line. And then he's just hoping that seeing as how he's 29 years old and he's been in the Premier League for over a decade, that at some point he can produce the goods. Yeah, I mean... I don't, I don't know. I actually sort of disagree on the uh, Walcott being a smart player, at least like lately. I just on Tuesday, I felt like he made so many stupid decisions. And I feel like this season he's, you know, when he first arrived, he was really good. Um, and I thought we had, you know, done some really good business by getting him. And I don't know, man, like lately, uh, it's like I see him try to dribble the ball when he should shoot and he shoots the ball when he should dribble and he holds the ball when he should cross and he crosses when he should hold the ball. And it's just, for me, I don't know. He, he's just so frustrating to me. And yeah, with Lookman, it's like, and actually I almost want to retract my statement earlier. Cause now that I think about the last Derby, Lookman was the one that was part of that big buildup play that led to the Sigurdsson goal. I forgot that he was so heavily involved in that play. Um, but yeah, I have no idea what's going on behind the scenes. Clearly he's not, he's not, you know, the coach's favorite, but I think talent wise, he's just incredible when he has the ball at his feet. He's so comfortable. He can dribble through three guys. He can hold the ball with three defenders on him. Um, but yeah, I have no idea what, what the deal is with, with his attitude or why he doesn't get picked as much. Cause clearly there's something going on that a lot of us aren't seeing that's going on behind the scenes right and so i guess that that will wrap up our lineup predictions i'm certainly anticipating uh hour before the kickoff on sunday to see what marco silva eventually rolls out i think even though we predicted several different combinations what what he chooses will inevitably surprise us and probably annoy us to some extent um but now for the last part of the show we're going to do 
our score predictions. And since Brendan, you are our guest, we will let you have the honor of going first with the score prediction. Oh God. Oh man. Uh, Head or heart. Head or heart. <sighs> one, one. I think I'd be over the moon that's, with a one, one. That's all I'm going to say. I'm just going to say one, one. And uh, yeah, I, I don't know. Fair enough. Alex? <laughs> you know, you read my mind, but I'm going to be a little more detailed and say that I think it's going to be 1-1, one, one, but I think that it's going to be Everton equalizing within the last 15 minutes, which seems to be uh, in fashion for some of these derbies. Jagielka off the bench. Golasso. Go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I'm going to be the Debbie Downer, as is uh, I, I'm, I tend to do from time to time. And I'm going to predict a loss. I'm going to predict a 1-0 no loss. But the reason I'm predicting a loss is because I feel like every time I predict a win on this show in a big game, it backfires horribly. And also, I'm just going into this game with the lowest possible expectations because I, I'm not letting myself get carried away with a 3-0 no win at Cardiff. And I think I've been let down in this game so many times. And it's Thursday night, so by Saturday or Sunday morning, I'll certainly have swung the other way and be predicting like a 5-0 no battering by us to Liverpool. But for now, I'm going 1-0 loss. I'm not trying to get ahead of myself here. James, did you just call yourself a swinger? (laughs) Uh, Those are your words, not mine. I'll just say that. He didn't deny it, Brendan. He didn't deny it. He didn't. Swinging James, as they call him. (laughs) I think think it's time we wrap things up here, guys. (laughs) Next up is going to be Forrest from Carolina Toffees talking about his multiple experiences in Liverpool, specifically at derby matches. What's up, everybody? I have Forrest Landy here from the Carolina Toffees. He has been to Liverpool, specifically to Goodison Park and the derby matches numerous times and so he would love to share what that experience was like Forrest, how you doing today yeah doing well man you are part of the carolina toffees so carolina is that does that encompass north carolina south carolina is that primarily north carolina no it's both of them yep wow so do y'all have multiple you know meetup spots or how does that work so uh we yeah we do kind of it's all the major cities asheville charlotte raleigh durham Greensboro, Columbia, um, and I think Greenville, South Carolina, and Charleston as well, of course. Um, and we'll post on social media where we meet up at times for the games, etc. Um, and I think, so I'm an admin on the Facebook page. Uh, I think we've got about 300 to 400 members on that. It's There's probably about 40 or 50 who are overseas and from other uh, groups around the country that you know just kind of join to see what's going on in the other groups. But for the most part, I mean, there's there's probably about 250 solid Carolina members in there. That's awesome. That actually blew me away because for some reason I expected it to be primarily North Carolina and your, you know, your uh, your city, just like we had or we talked to the Cincinnati Toffee guys the other night. Um, well, that's awesome. So, can you tell us a little bit about about your experience? How many times you've been to Goodison Park? When that was that sort of thing. Yeah, so I've been to Goodison in particular probably for seven or eight matches, um, and I've been over to England I think four times now, uh, and it's just I mean I'm, I'm in love with the place, especially the city of Liverpool. It's just a fantastic city. Scousers are great people. I know they tend to get a bad rap in the media and and from uh, people who live in other parts of England as being just all sorts of things, all these stereotypes, and they're not. They're just fantastic, very hardworking, very down to earth kind of people who can, you know, offer you a hand if you fall. I mean, they'll, they'll laugh with you rather than at you, but I mean, they're, they're very good people. <laughs> yeah. Um, Dude, yep. That's awesome. So when was the most recent Derby match that you've been to? So I was actually at the Anfield Derby this season. Nice. Yeah, that, uh, that was great in the build up because I got everything set up about six months before. So it was just waiting for it to happen. And then you get to the match and and obviously we know the result and what happened so it was kind of a kind of like a icicle on the heart where it just happened and you felt that pain and then it melted and you're like okay i gotta get over this i to enjoy the, rest <laughs> of the trip <laughs> right so were you there days prior to the match i assume 
I was there for about five or six days before I'm trying to, I, I was there for the Cardiff game at home and we won that. And then it was all leading up to, to Liverpool away. Um, and I've got some good friends over there. I was able to stay with uh, one of their families the whole duration of my trip. It's very lucky, very privileged to have that. Um, and yeah, and I traveled around the country a lot, you know, but I always like being based in Liverpool and that's where I want to see the most. It's where I know the most people. It's just, I could see myself living in that city one day. That's awesome. I, I, I would love to go hopefully sometime soon. So what was, what was the build up to the match like that week being in Liverpool with, with other fans and, or even opposition fans? So, uh, the stereotype of there being a lot of tourists is very true. Um, there are a lot of, a lot of tourists in the city come any big match for Liverpool, really any match, uh, any Liverpool home match. Um, but I mean, it was very palpable, very electric. You, every pub you went into, they were talking about it. It was on all the news, all the radio, BBC Mercy, Merseyside, everything that they had was about the Derby. And I mean, it's, it's something that in, in Liverpool on the day is it eats, it consumes the city. Like everybody's focused on it. Everybody plans their day around it, what they're doing after what they're doing before what they're doing during it. It's all based around the Derby because you'd be hard pressed to find a soul in that city. Who's from the area that doesn't care about one of those clubs. The way you are able to describe that really well is amazing, but it makes me super jealous. Yeah, I know. I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't talk too much about it because I want everybody to be able to go and, and experience that for themselves and hear it. But I mean, it's fantastic. I love it. Like if I could go to every Derby, both of them every season, that's all I'd go to. Like this, there's very little in, in American sports, in my opinion, that really compares to the atmosphere of even just a regular Premier League match. But but a derby in particular is it's something else. I mean, you could compare it to maybe like a college basketball rivalry, rivalry with UNC Duke, or I mean, maybe I don't know Green Bay Chicago in the NFL. But even then, I mean, it's just it's something else. It's just oof, it gives me chills thinking about. No kidding. So, were you able to walk with the Blues towards Anfield? Anfield or so? Yes, I did. Um, I was drinking at a pub called the Brick beforehand, which is notorious for. Um, or was notorious, I should say, for hooliganism back in the 80s. Um, and a lot of the main Everton hooligan groups would meet up there to drink before the match and then walk up together. So I went there naturally, you know, wanting to be around the center of the action um, with some mates and drank beforehand. It was, you know, there, I remember this one Irish guy who was just there trying to find a ticket. He was offering people like 300 pounds for a ticket. Um, no, nobody took him up on it, I think. And maybe if they had wow. known the result before, you know, beforehand, they would have, but Nobody wanted to sell their ticket. It's it's hard enough to get them as is. But um, when we walked up to the match, we had uh, a police escort. Um, we had maybe six or seven police on horses around us, and and well, really in front and behind, and then a couple walking beside. They didn't do too much until things started to kick off, and that happened as we got closer to Anfield. Um, so when you're walking towards Anfield from the brick, you go past Goodison, you go past Stanley Park, and you take a left onto Anfield Road, which takes you right past all these houses and bars that are all. Liverpool bars. And so, you know, you've got this group of hostile, you know, rival supporters walking by, there's bound to be some things that kick off. Um, somebody from the Everton end threw a smoke bomb at a pub, at a Liverpool pub. Oh. Um, and uh, I remember that moment because a, uh, a cop ran by me, like right by me and pinned him against a wall. And he was like right next to me. Oh, nice. That's, that's great. Um, when we got further up the road, some of the Liverpool fans threw bottles into the crowd and uh, the Everton supporters rushed at them. And the, the police like brought their horses in and cut everybody off and were screaming at everybody to get out of the way. And from there, it was just, I mean, there was a lot of saying, it wasn't, you know, all negative as I'm painting it, but those are the, those action points that stick out to you. Cause it's not something, yeah. you, I mean, you, you can see that in America a little bit, you know, if you go to a, a sports city like uh, Philadelphia, maybe, maybe even New York or, or Oakland, except they're not kind of doing that anymore, unfortunately for them. But just, just the, uh, the animosity between supporters is very, very just real. Like you can hear about it all the time. Somebody describing it, but it's very real. It happens. It's right there. And I was warned about it, you know, the whole week before the match. That's awesome. I mean, and that's, that's what we want to experience, right? Is like the passion. Because if I, if I run into a Liverpool fan here in the States, which happens more often than I'd like to admit, right? Very unfortunate. Yeah. Um, you know, I'll ask, I'll ask them who their team is if they're not wearing something Liverpool and, and they'll exclaim, oh, I'm a Liverpool fan. And, you know, it's more so of a little bit of a, a snide remark or something, but it's not like I want to, you know, 
punch your face in, right. which I'm assuming is is more so the the tune of how it goes there. So how was it being, you know, in Anfield, but more specifically, I guess we're talking about the Derby match at home coming up. So how was it being in Goodison for a match like that? So I was at uh, Roberto Martinez's first Derby, uh, the three three one back in I think it was 2013 or 2014. Um, and oh my gosh, Goodison is just the, it's one of those things where when you hear a commentator talk about Goodison, they always talk about how electric it is, how its atmosphere is something else. I mean, that is really where you see its atmosphere, where you hear, it, where you feel. It. I think in the past few years we haven't really felt that at Goodison, but I mean, just it's it's something else, man. You feel it really when you wake up the morning of and then you get out into the street and you walk to the pub and you walk with the blues. And I mean, you just see and feel like there, there's tension and, and hope and, and just, just like electricity in the air. Like it re- you really feel it. And it's, 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 it's hard to, to put into words, but it's something that's just, oof. and then you get into Goodison and it's constant singing. It's, you feel that you sway with the crowd, you know, when, when everything get a chance, everybody stands up. And and they stay standing until the ball is cleared into the Liverpool end. And even then, most of them stay standing. The only reason they don't all is because there's a lot of shots for people to sit down. They, you know, some people don't stand up the whole match, which is neither here nor there. But it's it's something else. Uh, yeah. Oof. So if you had to pick your favorite thing, just one thing about going to a match at Goodison Park, and you can even narrow it down to a match against Liverpool at Goodison Park. What is that favorite thing? It can be leading up to the match. It can be during the match. It can be after the match, whatever it is. So there's a lot of things I love about going to Goodison from the walk up, you know, the the beforehand, you know, getting a, a pie or a beer or whatever, um, going into the concourse and, and speaking with other blues. But I think for me is walking into Goodison, like actually into the stands for the first time for that match. And you just, you see what's laid out in front of you. You see the pitch, you see, the four stands. I've always sat in the Gladys Street, always in the lower Gladys. So all the times I've been to Goodison. So you see the four stands and how everything's laid out you, and you can see people coming into their seats. And, and and really when you're going into Goodison as somebody who's just going for a couple of matches, you're surrounded by season ticket holders, especially in the Gladys. That's almost all season ticket holders until you get really far back into it. But I mean, there are people who know everybody around them. Like it's, it's, it's such a I, family's not the right word, but it's a community thing. Like there, there's a real sense of belonging. We're here together. Blue. Exactly. Like it's a togetherness that I, I've never felt at any sort of American sporting event ever. It's it's something that's totally unique to, I think, to soccer and more specifically to England. Like oof, it just, I, I love, I love that. It's really cool because for people like myself and also like James, unfortunately, we've only ever watched Everton on NBCSN, mm-hmm. right? Broke college kids are that's that's a real thing, right? But uh, you know, it, it's I feel as though it's pretty easy to let TV programming kind of hype things up. But from you know directly from the horse's mouth, right? You have been there multiple times, and it sounds like it's even more hype than it comes off when Rebecca Lowe is on TV exclaiming that the match is about to kick off, and and what it means to each team and each club and, and, and the, the fans in the city. And that's insane. I mean, you can only get so much from TV microphones and cameras, man. I mean, they only tell you a small part of the story when it comes to the stands. I know Goodison sounds very quiet uh, on TV these days. It and, does. It, it, even for some big match, it won't sound quiet on Sunday for the Derby. It's going to be very up and at them unless Liverpool score early. Then it's going to be a lot of groaning. But uh, I mean, it's constant noise in there. It's constant talking. You hear, so I don't know if you see on Twitter, whenever somebody will comment about fans near them moaning about a player or yelling at a player. Like, I mean, that's, it's constant everywhere in the pitch. You hear it. I mean, you'll hear it from, you know, two sections over in the stand you're in. You'll hear it from the person right behind you from right next to you. I mean, it's, there's this constant noise and there isn't a lot of singing at Goodison at the moment. There's an atmosphere issue that I don't think the club need to address so much as the fans do. They need to kind of find themselves a bit, but, I, I mean, there's a lot more to Goodison than, than what NBC and SN and Rebecca Lowe are going to tell you. Right. And, you know, I am very much under the impression that the 3-0 win this week is going to play a huge factor in mm-hmm. at least the beginning atmosphere at Goodison Park. Yeah, it, I think if we had drawn or lost against Cardiff, uh, there'd be a lot more trepidation 
going into that match. I mean, there already is quite a bit. You know, there's still not a great amount of confidence in the manager and players at the moment. But just just having that, you know, a three 0 win away from home is good, no matter who you play against. Um, so you you know, we're going to take a lot of positive from that. The fans will, and the players will at least. You know, they're going to have a bit more confidence in their play. And what you know, the fans have to expect going into Sunday is just getting behind the team. Like that's all we can do at this point. We can't play for them. We can't you know be their passion on the pitch but we can be the voice that carries them in the stands is saying that um you know the gladys sucks the ball into the net i mean it's very true the gladys street is an awesome like awesome stand of football i've only ever been to four uh stadiums goodison anfield i've been to st mary's in southampton and st james in newcastle i mean they're good 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 stadium st mary's is probably the worst of them but you know st james and anfield anfield obviously has its own atmosphere it was okay for the derby wasn't anything special personally um, but I'll never give them credit, even if it's due to them. I was um, about to say. <laughs> but the Gladys Street, I mean, it's really where it's really the heartbeat of Goodison. And to be in the middle of it and for a derby, it's unbelievable. All right, for So to wrap things up, can you give me a score prediction for this weekend? My heart says 2-1 and my head says 1-1. Um, but I'm going to go and- with my heart and say 2-1 because we are due a win over them. It's been almost a decade now, I think. Absolutely. Well, at least someone was optimistic in their prediction. Yeah, I'm I'm always going to be optimistic. I thought we'd win at Anfield too, so <laughs> shows what I'm shows what I know. Well, then hopefully you didn't uh, curse us. Fingers crossed, man. Well, either way, I really appreciate you coming on to the show, specifically for this shorter bit. But we're excited to have you on in the next couple weeks for Chelsea. Yeah, absolutely. I can't wait. Thanks for tuning in to the American Toffee Podcast. Be sure to follow us on Twitter at USA Toffee Pod to stay up to date on the latest episode releases and Everton news. And we'll see you guys next time.